Okay, um, starting up again here with chapter four, the fourth of the videos. I'm going to try and make sort of shortish videos here. So let's look at an example of confidence intervals. Last time we just looked at the principles, so now let's look at an example of how things work. Let's look at some homework scores from a previous course that I taught. Uh, a, sample, a sample of 54 students and we scored the homework on a scale from 0 to 100. You can see a few people did very poorly. They got below 20 percent. Some people got up to 100 percent. Good for them. So the standard deviation of this is 18.9 and the mean is 57.2 of our sample. So let's take an imaginary normal population. Let's say we just happen to have stumbled across the mean, the true population mean of all possible homework scores for all possible people who could have taken homework number one in my previous class. So that's the population value. And we don't know what the um, standard deviation of the population is. So this is a little sloppy, and we wouldn't do this in practice, but let's just say that the population standard deviation is 18.9. Now we do that, we just have to correct for it. We're not going to correct for it. We're just going to say, let's, let's assume the population standard deviation is the same as our sample standard deviation. Just like the mean, we assume that the mean is the same. So this is a little bit fudgy right here. Well, then we have to imagine ourselves to ourselves, what is the distribution of all possible... Um, so we've got the, the imaginary distri distribution that our sample came from. But then we have to imagine, what's the sampling distribution of the mean? So we want to compare our mean to all possible means that might have been collected. And that new distribution will be much skinnier. Much, it'll have a lot less variability than, our old dis than the distribution of all raw possible raw scores. But it'll have the same uh, mean. This, the mean will still be 57.2, but the standard error of this new distribution will be much smaller. The standard deviation will be much smaller than the original standard deviation. It'll be our original standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, square root of 54. So we go down from 18.9 to 2.57, just two and a half points. So our estimate for our mean is really pretty tight. And if we just chop off uh, two and a half percent of that distribution in each tail, then we find that the scores that correspond to chopping off two and a half percent, so the distribution of all possible means, that we might have obtained under these assumptions, which are some pretty strict assumptions and might not be true. But the distribution of all possible means is from 52.2 to 62.2. 95% of them will lie within that range. So then we could flip around and say, we are 95% confident that the true, set, the true population mean for all scores on homework one, whatever that population is, lies between 52.2 and 62.2 points. That's a really low score. Those students were not happy. Um, that's our 95% confidence interval. And see, our sample mean was right there, and then we have the two numbers for our confidence interval. A lot of work, and when we get done, all we have is a sample mean and two numbers. That's the confidence interval. So here's a funny joke from Randall Monroe of XKCD making fun of all the political commentators who were talking about how crazy and uncertain the last presidential race was when all the people who ran the stats for like the whole year were saying, no, we know who's going to win. It's pretty obvious. <laughs> So let's run through some examples. Um, consider a poll about ice cream cone consumption with a, stand a sample size of 500. The sample mean is 42.3 ice cream cones per year. And for some reason, we know that the population uh, standard deviation of ice cream cone consumption is 12.1 cones. I don't know why we know that, but we can't do this particular type of problem without knowing that, so we know it. Find the 95% confidence interval for this estimate. Let me pause. Now, the easy way to do this is just run through the formula. You've got all the things that you need as long as you keep them straight and plug them into the formula. But as much as possible, I want to always run through the whole thought process for how this formula works. So you've got the distribution of means. That little x bar down there, it means this is the sampling distribution of means. We want to find the middle 95% of the sampling distribution of means with 2.5% in each tail. So to find 2.5% in each tail, we need z-scores of negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. Now you can skip past z-scores if you're using p-norm or something like that in R, but I'm going to go through the z-score thing too. So the mean of the sample was 42.3. The standard deviation of the sample, or the standard deviation of the population is 12.1. Our confidence level is 0.95. Therefore, half of alpha is 2.5% or 0.025. 
So the z for that is 1.96, as we've established. So the confidence interval is these two things, 42.3 plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error. Um, and that is 42.3 plus, plus or minus 1.06. So this, this part will always be the same. You do plus or minus, and you can reduce this. So the margin of error is 1.06 ice cream cones. So 42.3, you just run through this math, and this is what you get, 41.24. 43.36, the end. Now you have a confidence interval, 95% confidence interval. And that looks pretty tight with a sample size of 500, which is a ridiculously large sample size. Then you have a very, very precise estimate. You're much more confident that you know where the mean is. You're 95% confident that the mean lies between, in a range of just two points, um, because you had such a big sample size. There you go. So another one. Dr. J studies bats. He's recorded the frequencies of 228 of them in New Mexico, and he finds the mean frequency. Now he knows the mean for bats in Arizona is different. It's higher, 39.1 kilohertz. And they have a standard deviation of 2.1. So he's, he's going to assume that that's the population standard deviation for his bats as well, and the ones in New Mexico. That's a little, we do that kind of thing from time to time, so let's just assume that. Um, so calculate the 90% confidence interval for his sample and compare it to the Arizona average. So he's got, he can assume that his um, sample came from, uh, we know the assumption's a little crazy, but we assume that his sample came from a population of raw score distributions with a mean of 34.7 kilohertz and a standard deviation of 2.1. Now we know these are assumptions that might not hold up, but they will help us get to a confidence interval, which can still be very useful. So don't get too hung up on these assumptions not actually being perfectly super realistic. They're realistic enough, I think. So the sampling distribution of means for a sample size of 228, all possible samples of 228 out of that population would have the same mean, but would have a much smaller standard deviation. Standard deviation is going to be 2.1 divided by the square root of 228. So our standard error is point. 139. That's a very small little standard error because we had a big sample size, over 200. So the standard error is 0 0.14, 0 0.139. So the z-scores there, we find our 90% confidence interval, which is 1.65 and minus 1.65 z-score. Translate those back into real numbers just by using the formula. So you just plug the formula here in. Once you've got everything all diagrammed, just plug the formula back in. And we find the upper limit and the lower limit, 34.47 and 34.93. And if you run that math, I hope that's what that turns out to be, although I haven't double-checked today. So we would report this, like the mean is 34.7 kilohertz from his sample. 90% confidence interval for the mean is 34.47, 34.93 kilohertz. So we need to answer this question. So the Arizona bats had a mean of 39.1 megahertz. So in this case, is it plausible that the Arizona bats and the New Mexico bats are the same colony of bats or the same species or something? I think Dr. J has evidence that they are not because 39.1 is way up here. It's not within the 90% confidence interval. The 90% confidence interval tells us where we are 90% confident that the true mean might be. So the true mean of New Mexico bats, we think our best guess is it's in here. The Arizona mean is way out there, so our best guess is that the Mexico bats are somehow different from the Arizona bats because the mean here, their mean is here. The Arizona bats mean is way out there. So the cable company again. 200 cables, sample of 200. The average diameter is... 1237 millimeters as always, standard deviation of 124 millimeters. What's the 95% confidence interval? So here's a diagram of the way things work out. I'm not going to walk through all the math, but if you run through the math, you will find that the confidence interval is 1219.81 to 1254.19. Some variation if you did things by hand. I used R, which is ridiculously precise. So if you did it by hand, especially using Z tables. So this is the distribution of original, uh, of raw scores. And then this is the distribution of means. This is the sampling distribution of means of sample size 200. So that's why we get such a nice small confidence interval there. So a city in New York takes a random sample, this time a sample of 81 of its population. 
The mean age is 43.1 years. The population standard deviation, for some reason, is known. 2.7 years. What's the 90% confidence interval? The 90% confidence interval, you're going to use a z-score of 1.65 and negative 1.65 for this. Um, and if, if you run the math, the mean plus or minus uh, z times 2.7 divided by the square root of 81, so 2.7 divided by 9, you're going to find that the confidence interval is 43.21 to 44.19. If you didn't get that answer, then you should go back and run the math again. And if you still didn't get the answer, maybe you should email me and tell me that maybe my slides are wrong, which is always a possibility. So interpreting these things, we often say we are 95% confident that the population mean is between, or lies between, or whatever, or mu, or something, between these two numbers, and we name the numbers. It's a fuzzy, fudgy way to say it, but it is not wrong, and that's important. Not being wrong is a really important deal. <coughs> so these things are wrong. There is a 95% probability that the population mean lies between this and this, or 95% of the observations can be found between this and this, or 95% of sample means are being... These are terrible. These are wrong, wrong, deeply, fundamentally, horribly wrong. And every once in a while, even statisticians online, oh, not real statisticians, stats people online will spout these things. Sometimes people think it's easier to, to teach students uh, really dumb, bad things because it's simpler. I don't think so. We'll teach you the real things. If you can't handle the truth, either I don't say it or I don't say it or you fail or something like that. So let's look at what the actual interpretation is. The actual interpretation is, like say for a 95% confidence interval, that if we were to calculate bazillions of 95% cal cal confidence intervals over and over and over again from the same sample because we drew bazillions of samples and each time we, we calculated the mean and each sample we calculated the confidence interval. If we did that, 95% of those confidence intervals would contain the true mean, the true population mean. We still don't know what the population mean is. Our sample didn't really finally resolve that for us. It gave us a better idea, but we don't really know all we know is that if we kept doing this over and over and over again, then eventually we would know because 95% of those would contain the true population mean. So we can do a fun little vis visualization. We can specify a big population, randomly sample. So with R, we can tell R, you know, think of this gigantic population. We can randomly sample with a particular sample size, uh, and this one will do 50 times, and calculate a confidence interval for each one of those 50 times. And then we can count what percentage of those confidence intervals actually contain the true population. So if you run this code, we'll be able to do this demonstration here. Just a moment. All right, so let's just get that going. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let's crank up R here. And... Let's copy in that stuff from that slide. Now, I don't need to install the animation package, so I'm going to skip the first two lines. I'm just going to put in the last line. So let me paste that in here from the slide. So what this will do is it will um, show me this simulation with a 95% confidence interval, and each sample has 20 observations. Each sample from which the confidence intervals were created has 20 observations. Hmm. Except I forgot this part. Oops. And that doesn't help. Okay, here we go. So you can see what's happening here. This horizontal line is the mean of the imaginary population that was created. So this with R, you can create an entire population, and you can know what all the values are. So that's the beauty of simulations. And each of these vertical lines that comes up here is a mean and a confidence interval from a random sample a random sample of 20 individuals. I specified 20 here. So 20 observations and a mean. And so you can see that most of the time, the confidence interval actually contains the population mean. The population mean doesn't move, but confidence intervals do as we randomly sample. And up here, you see what percentage of the samples actually contain the population mean. And actually, this is a little bit of a surprising run because it looks like we might actually hit 100%. So yeah, 100% of our samples contain the population mean when we would have expected theoretically only 95% of them to do so. So let's do this um, with a much bigger sample. So a sample size is of 100. Now this scale is going to change. It's going to get smaller because the confidence intervals are going to get much, much smaller now. 
So you see this is much smaller. You've got from 0 to 0 0.2 to 0 0.4. This one missed. So 95% confidence interval we missed. So our average uh, hit rate is only 93% um, right now. So we're doing 50, 50 random samples, 50 confidence intervals. And we're seeing that the confidence intervals don't always contain the population mean. Our numbers have dropped a little lower. Now, on average, if we did this hundreds of times, we would expect to get very, very close to 95% of these confidence intervals containing the population mean, and very close to exactly 5% of them not containing the population mean. Right now, we're at 93-ish percent which is pretty close and not bad for an n of 50. So we got 94 percent. So um, we can change the sample size and let's say a sample size of 5 but this time a confidence in level of 90 so 90 percent confidence intervals. The confidence intervals are smaller now because if we're willing to put up with less confidence then we can have more precision. And a small confidence interval means a more precise confidence interval, a more precise estimate. But we're going to expect to miss 10% of the time now. So our error rate essentially should be 10%. Our coverage rate should only be 90% now because we were willing to put up with a smaller confidence level. Now I'm going to stop this just so I can show you. I hit the escape key to interrupt that. Let me do this and let's look at a 99% confidence interval, I don't know, 25. 99% confidence intervals are much larger. If you want more confidence, then you have to cover a larger span of the number line there. You have to put up with more uncertainty about what's inside that confidence interval. But because it's a, a larger confidence interval, we hit more often. We're much more likely to be to be accurate and for our confidence interval to contain the true population mean mu. I suppose you could skip to the end of this. It's going to be another few seconds here. It takes a couple minutes each time. Still got a 100% rate where we would expect only 99% because of this. Put that right there on that 9. Yeah, we got 100%, so it's a fluke. If we did this over and over again, we might get 98 or 96% sometimes. All right, so that's that demonstration. Now let's get back to the lecture. So that was kind of fun. The very, very super-duper accurate interpretation of what a confidence interval is, and we rarely say this except when teaching, um, because it takes a lot of breath, and it's just too, too many words, um, is exactly what you just saw on that on that previous simulation. If we were to repeat our study many, many times, uh, randomly sampling from the same population over and over again, and calculate a mean and a 95% or whatever the percent is, 90% or 99%, let's say 95% confidence interval for each of those sample means, then 95% of those intervals would contain the true population mean. This does not mean that we ever know where the true population mean is, or and we never know whether our sample and our confidence interval is one that actually contains the mean. There's a lot of ambiguity here. You just have to kind of live with that in statistics. You never know whether any one confidence interval contains the population mean. If you have hundreds of them, then you can really zoom in on with extreme accuracy and confidence in where you think the mean is, but you need hundreds of studies for that. So the final questions here. How many ways are there to reduce the size of the confidence interval? We love reducing the size of confidence intervals because that means we're measuring with more precision and we're more confident about where the true population mean is, which is often our research question. So think of this. Can you change the mean value in any way? Would that reduce the confidence interval size? Can you change the z-value? Now, the z-value has everything to do with the confidence level. So can you go from a 90 to a 95 percent, or a 95 to a 99, or a 99 back to a 95 percent? Will that change the width of the confidence interval? If you have a different standard deviation of the raw scores, will that change the confidence interval width? And if you have a different sample size, will that change the confidence interval width? This sounds like the kind of thing I would put on an exam.